everyone. Welcome. We're so happy you're here. How is New Year's? In bed by nine? Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> and of course, we're going to need a joke, right? A really good joke today, of course. Um, I like screen these ahead of time. <laughs> I hear they're developing a mind controlled air freshener. And when you think about it, it makes sense. <laughs> that was rough. <laughs> it's kind of fun, kind of fun. So we're uh, starting a series, and we're doing a series on discipleship. Um, that's really uh, God's heart for encounter um, this upcoming season. And so thinking about discipleship, you know, you kind of think about what it means in terms of relationship and friendship and connection. And so as you think about friendships and relationships, you can start on the far end of the extreme where you get an acquaintance, potentially maybe an enemy, somebody who is frustrating to you, and you might go all the way to the other side to one of your besties. And this sermon, we're calling it Besties with Jesus. Woo-hoo! Woo-hoo! So I'm going to share a, a brief story on one end of the spectrum, somebody that recently was a little frustrating to me, kind of. So I'm at Walmart, right? And it's after Christmas, and uh, I'm buying Christmas wrapping paper. Smart, because half price, right? Like, And so I'm getting a lot. I have like, I don't know, four or six rolls. And I go through self-checkout. And, you know, I just scan my card and swipe, and it's Christmas paper. That's all I'm buying. That's it. I don't even put it in a bag. I just am carrying it out, you know, because I believe in recycle, all that stuff. Anyway, so I'm walking out the door, throwing my receipt in the trash because it's just stupid Christmas paper. Throw my receipt in the trash. A guy at the door, who like the Walmart employee, she's like, I need to see your receipt. I'm like, what? No, I need to see your receipt. I said, look. I said, it's wrapping paper, (laughs) right? And it's on sale, Like half price. No, I need to see your receipt. I don't have my receipt. Well, you need to go find it. And I'm like, I'm going to find you. (laughs) So we go, I was mad. So I go back, and it's in the trash. And the guy who is supervising all the self-checkout, you know, because they have somebody who watches it, you don't steal stuff. The guy at the checkout guy, he's like, Kevin, I watched her pay. She's okay. And Kevin is like, no, no, no. I got to see that receipt. And I am fished through the trash. I'm like, here's your receipt. (laughs) And he looks at it. He like, ding, ding, ding. I'm like, this is ridiculous. I want to rip his head off, you know. So that would be an example of like an antagonistic, you know, frustrating end of the spectrum in terms of a relationship. On the other side of it, Isabel has something a little bit more warm and fuzzy. Thank God, right? (laughs) I'm in college, I don't know if any of you know, um, and I go to Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, and one of my best friends is my friend Allie, and she was my freshman RA, so I was a little afraid of her, but we ended up being friends, and this year she is a teacher in Tulsa, and I'm a student, but we are close friends, and we have a standing Wednesday night dinner date. Every Wednesday night we go out to eat, but here's the kicker. If we've had a great week, things have just gone super well, we go to Olive Garden, we go to Chewy's, we get nachos, things are going well. If we have not had a good week, we go to Chili's. We order water and appetizers and we just cry over our quesadillas. (laughs) But the key part here is Allie and I spend time with each other no matter if things are going super, super well or if things are going very, very not well. And of the, I think, 12 weeks in the semester, we spent probably eight of those at Chili's. So we really show up for each other. And no matter what, if it's good or bad, we want to be there for each other because we appreciate each other's friendship and we understand where each other is in life. And I feel like we have the one end of the spectrum I don't really want to be friends with Kevin. I'm fine with just being an acquaintance with Kevin. I don't want to get to know him. He doesn't seem like the kind of chap to, you know, really show up and support you. But on the other end, we have deep, intentional connection. We're going to talk about the three different levels. There's a a little middle in there. Um, And we're calling it, everybody get ready, kinesthetic connections. 
That is a 25 cent word if I ever heard one. And kinesthetic involves movement of some kind. It involves shifting. It involves something being active. And so in each of these three areas of connection that we have, there's movement. You can go in and out of each one. You can be an acquaintance, a friend. And then the deepest level of connection that we're calling is discipleship. Everybody say discipleship. And so, Mom, what was the first kind of level of connection? Um, it would not be Kevin. Kevin would be the outer circle of hell. Not quite. <laughs> that sounds awful, right? You're like, you shouldn't say that. Well, you know, it's in the Bible, along with a couple other words. <laughs> I know, right? I need to get saved. But <laughs> on the outside, we have an acquaintance. And uh, Jesus, if you look at his life, he had acquaintances. And he had people who came to him. And they came to him basically to get something from him, a miracle, a solution, a healing. And, and the, it was all good. And those relationships, you see the widow of Nain. Uh, she came, she was, they had a funeral procession. And Jesus stopped the funeral procession because her son was being buried. And he raised <laughs> her son from the dead. That was kind of a like, Ooh, drop your teeth. Another, I would say, initial outside kind of acquaintance relationship for Jesus was the Samaritan woman at the well. In John chapter 4. And I like her because initially it's just the acquaintance. You know, it's Jesus sits down by the well. She comes and he asks her for a drink of water. You know, it's kind of like, hey, can I see your receipt? Not quite. <laughs> but can I have a drink of water? But it's acquaintance. And in that initial acquaintance, you know, there starts to be um, more and more connection, more and more conversation, more and more relationship. And I think for all of us um, in the room watching online, we've all had, at least at the minimum, some kind of acquaintance, some kind of brush with Jesus. Back in the day, we used to have those bumper stickers, I found it. Anybody remember those yellow bumper stickers that said, I found it? I always wondered what it was. And I, I think it would be better to say I found him. <laughs> or maybe he found me. Because the point of it is that there's this at least initial introduction, acquaintance with Jesus. So I think most of us have had kind of uh, that like first off, first blush. And, and maybe we find ourselves in that place. I think sometimes we have seasons in our life where we are deeper with Jesus and then sometimes we're not quite as deep. Anybody find that your life has some ups and downs with Jesus? I mean, I just feel that to be true. And so whether you're watching now online or you're in the room and you find yourself kind of like in a deep, deep level with Jesus, fantastic if you find yourself kind of more at an acquaintance level. But again, it's kinesthetic. We're moving. We're not being stationary. There's progress. There's growth. There's, there's potential. There's uh, intentional direction. And so as we think about that, I just encourage you, there's a couple of hurdles that maybe if you find yourself in this, in this acquaintance mode, uh, a little bit more kind of on the outskirts, there's a couple of hurdles you might think about um, in terms of how you can overcome and how you can kind of move in a positive, more purposeful, more intimate connection with Jesus. What would some of those hurdles be, Isabel? Um, just in the biblical examples, we have the rich young ruler, and his problem was wealth. Jesus said, give up everything and follow me, and he was like, uh, no. I'm not going to do that um, because he valued his wealth more than other, more than, you know, following Jesus. Um, and another, I think a good example of someone who was able to kind of make it through that hurdle is Nicodemus. Um, we see him talking with Jesus and he has serious questions and concerns regarding the religious validity of Jesus. And, you know, how can I be born again? That's not possible. Jesus is saying, no, it's not that. And so Nicodemus is kind of working through these religion and this mindset that he has of Jesus is more important than my religious beliefs. Jesus is more important than this. Um, we have all the Pharisees healing on the Sabbath. Um, and then kind of another really important one is being offended with Jesus. Guys, I promise you at some point in your life, you're going to be offended at Jesus because our nature as humans is not to be all perfect all the time. And Jesus' nature is to be all perfect all the time. And so when we're not perfect and we think that we are and Jesus says, sorry, you're not, our immediate response is, oh my God, I don't want to, no, stop. That offends me. That hurts me. I don't want that. But if we can sacrifice our pride 
and we can prioritize Jesus over offense. And the key word here is prioritize. If we can prioritize Jesus over our finances, over our religion, over our preconceived notions, over our intelligence, this is one for me that's been a real struggle. <laughs> but prioritizing Jesus over like intelligence and academic wellness, because sometimes Jesus is not going to make sense, and I'm not going to understand it. But I have to prioritize his will and him over what I think and over what I believe and just kind of let that be. I'd also say another uh, obstacle sometimes is when you, we get angry, hurt, disappointed, frustrated with Jesus. He's not doing what we want him to do, <laughs> right? He's supposed to be all-powerful, and I'm not seeing it. How come Jesus didn't stop this? How come Jesus didn't intervene? How many of you ever struggled with that? I think the whole room, everybody watching online, and some of us even now in this minute, it's hard for us. But I think we have to be careful that we don't let an offense with Jesus be more important than our relationship with him. I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand. And lots of questions. Why did da 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 da, da fill in, right? I don't know. And, and sometimes getting comfortable and, and accepting, I don't know. I won't know. Heaven, maybe. But at this point, I'm not going to let that be the, the hurdle, the obstacle uh, for my kinesthetic growth, progress, connection with Jesus. And so in an acquaintance mode, we want to look at those hurdles and think about what does that look like in my life? Are there some hurdles that, that maybe I'm wrestling with? Um, but also, as we think through it, let's look at the middle. So we started acquaintance, moving kind of in progress, closer and closer. Let's look at friendship with Jesus. Um, and there are lots of friendships with Jesus that we read about in the New Testament. You want to share a lot of those with us? Yeah, I would say that most of the 12 disciples probably were comfortably friends with Jesus. Um, Mary, Martha, maybe even Lazarus, um, Mary Magdalene. And then this is also where I would put Nicodemus, too. Um, love Nicodemus, super cool guy. This is where I would put him solidly and just efficiently in friendship. And the difference between acquaintance and friendship here is acquaintance is when Jesus is giving you something because Jesus loves to give good presents. But a friendship requires the person to do something or to participate with Jesus, giving something back to Jesus, saying, okay, let's move forward together. Um, practically with the disciples, we see them dropping everything and following him, prioritizing Jesus above it all. We know that Peter had a family, and he would prioritize Jesus above his family. That is not an easy thing to do, um, but he did it, and I'm really proud of him to, that he was able to do it. And so we're, moving in friendship with Jesus means listening, responding, and walking with him, giving it back to him. Jesus loves us, and he wants love. And, you know, loving others, participating with Jesus, joining in Jesus in relationship to love others, that's what being friends with him is. Just being a part of the equation, not just Jesus, not just receiving from him, but giving back to him and giving to others too. Um, and there are a couple of, you know, key hurdles that come with this little area of relationship of kinesthetic connection. Um, and I think the first one is success especially in the church, I think there are some issues with the numbers being more important than the relationship. We have the Great Commission. It says go out, go into the world, make disciples, baptizing them. Hallelujah. That's so great. But we get tied up on, okay, how many people did I get? Well, if it, if it wasn't over 15, it wasn't an effective service. I'm sorry, but Jesus would go to the cross for one person. Jesus would do it all again just for me. Do you know how crazy that is? He would die again for one person. And if we have the mindset of it wasn't good enough if I didn't have more than 10, that is completely against the whole idea of the gospel because Jesus is all about the personal, the connection, and the one-on-one. -on -one. Hallelujah. Another one, I think, is genuine love. Sometimes it can be hard to love at the sake of ourselves. Sometimes it can be hard to love in spite of offenses we have at people. That is something that I <laughs> struggle with more than anything. Um, and I think the biggest hurdle that kind of keeps people in just friendship and not quite in discipleship is failure. And failure is really, really difficult <laughs> to make peace with. Um, 
we have so many disciples. Judas is a great example. He failed really, really badly. He did not do the right thing. And he couldn't deal with it. He didn't respond in the way that Jesus wants him to respond. But on the counter of that, we see Peter. Peter is a screw-up if I ever saw one. I mean, he denied Jesus three times and was just so broken. We see him on, you know, walking on the water. He took his eyes off of Jesus, but what's important isn't the fact that he failed. It's what he did afterwards, and he stuck with Jesus, and he stayed with him, Um, and I'm going to share a little bit about my own kind of failure, I guess. Um, I don't know if anybody here knows this, but I'm a second-generation pastor's kid. What? (laughs) No way. I am, Um, and something that is pretty stereotypical for pastor's kids. I like to call it the lion and the lamb. Either you become completely nuts, and everyone, you know, oh, well, that's the pastor's kid that lost the plot, or you're the lamb, where you're just like, oh, Jesus, I've never made a bad decision in my life. I'm so holy. Look at me, a pastor's kid. (laughs) I don't like any of those. But um, a couple of years ago, I like most, I, w- I would say probably like most people in here, had a really super fun, that's sarcasm, season in my life where I was not cool with Jesus and I was not okay with him. And I felt just so gross and so broken. And more than anything, I felt like a failure because I felt like I had this person, you know, I'm a pastor's kid. I served in the youth ministry. I went to Christian school. I did everything right. And here I am failing because I don't believe in God anymore. And that was one of the hardest moments in my life because it felt like there was all these expectations on me that I was putting on me, that everybody was putting on me, and I was just failing because I couldn't hang on to my faith, and I couldn't hang on to Jesus. And I was so broken and so disappointed in myself, not only because I had lost, or I thought that I had lost a relationship with Jesus, but because I had failed my parents, I had failed my grandparents, I had failed the church, I didn't know what I was gonna do with my future. But in that season of my life, Jesus showed up in a crazy amazing way, and I remember I was at a church service, and he gave me this vision, and I was drowning in the vision, and that's exactly what I was doing in my life. I was drowning, and Jesus was saying, I'm not at the shore trying to throw you a lifeline. I'm not watching you drown. I'm down in the water with you, with you while you're drowning, and I'm never going to leave you. There's nowhere you can go that I'm not there, and I will be with you. We can drown together until you need to come to the surface. Until you're ready, you can come. And throughout it all, all of my doubts, all of the terrible decisions I made, Jesus was there with me every step of the way. And I feel like that, in that season of my life, that's what really brought me from just friendship into discipleship with Jesus, was the fact that he was always with me, and he reminded me of that constantly. Well, I don't know what to say to that. That was awesome. Can you do it again? No. (laughs) <laughs> I think um, for me in terms of failure I know there were some years ago pre-kids um, that I was you know doing Bible quiet time in the morning and and uh, it was I liked it and it was kind of going through the motions but I felt like Holy Spirit really confronted me and said you know what Sarah you're doing this your little quiet time thing uh, so you can get sermons <laughs> So you can be an amazing speaker. So you can have like amazing insight and revelation. You're not doing this for a relationship with me. You're doing it for the mechanics for your profession. And so that you look really polished and and super, super like informed and insightful, revelation, all that stuff to be impressed, make yourself feel good. I was like, that's not true. (laughs) No, I'm here with you. Well, yeah, but you're doing it for a sermon because you're speaking on Wednesday night and you need something to share on Wednesday night. That's why you're doing it. And so we had this wrestle, I don't know, several months, maybe over a year, year and a half. And guess who won? (laughs) Go figure. (laughs) Jesus won. Thank goodness. Um, And so it's interesting because I think a lot of times in the friendship piece, we, we want Jesus. We love Jesus. We think he's cool. But I think a lot of times we do it for kind of motives that may not be just out of pure relationship, mm-hmm. out of pure connection. And um, I, I remember little, little, little. 
Sunday school, probably with Donna Johnson, who comes, you know, Donna. God bless Donna. I talk about her all the time. But I, I'll never forget going back in church and doing Sunday school and all the church stuff, all that. And I remember, you know, uh, I had various people tell me, well, you know, you should do it, you know, and, and it's the right thing to do. And, and they, I had, there were all these, like, motives. That, and I just remember talking with Jesus when I was really little and said, you know, should isn't the best. I can't, sh- I can't make should last, <laughs> right? The shoulds run out. I should do, you know, the guilt stuff. It's not going to sustain and, and keep me going, sustain me. And I was like, well, what, what's the deal here? How? How can I keep connection with you? How can I keep relationship with you? What's the best motive? And I just felt like God said to me, love. Love me, Sarah. I was like, oh, my goodness. Love, love, love holds the line. Love is that. And if, if I know that God loves me and I respond in love, then that's the intimacy, connection, and relationship piece. It turns move, moves away from friendship and religion and some of the, the window dra- dressing and moves us into that deeper intimate connection. So as we think about that, this is the third level. We've moved from acquaintance through friendship, and now we're looking at discipleship. And this would be the deepest level. And what does that look like for us, Belly? So the purpose of discipleship um, it has some really funky Greek root. Why don't you go ahead and share that, what that means? Huh? <laughs> I'm Hebrew, no, 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 she's no, no, Greek. No. So uh, it's a, it means to be a learner. Mateos meaning to learn. Um, and the idea of learning uh, is with, with the whole discipleship thing is that you sit at the master's feet, at your teacher's feet, to become like your teacher, to reflect, to look like. So that there's, when, when you look at the teacher and you look at the student, more and more the student looks like the teacher. The student acts like the teacher. The student um, chooses, prioritizes. Everything becomes a reflection of the teacher. And so that's the idea that goes behind discipleship. Which is crazy awesome. They would spend all their time together. Um, you know, they would emulate the walk, how they talked. Their goal was to be just like their teacher. And... In this inner group discipleship, we're going to put Peter, James, and John in this group. Peter, because he made it through all the hurdles. I mean, we start at the beginning with acquaintance, and Jesus, you know, gave him all the fish, and he was like, what? And then he prioritized Jesus above his family, above his job, above everything, and so he moved into friendship. And Peter, James, and John love them. But if we look at the transfiguration, they were not successes all the time, believe it or not. And they failed. But then they moved on. They stayed with Jesus. They kept chasing after him. They received forgiveness and moved on. And in this inner group, in this discipleship, our goal is to be just like Jesus, to emulate him. And this can be done in a multiple, multitudinous ways. (laughs) Um, But I think one of the biggest ones is letting go of brokenness. And trust me, brokenness is comfortable. Some of the hurts that we have, scars and open scars, can be really comfortable to sit in. Oh, a fence, so easy to just sit in a fence. It is so comfortable. My brokenness, I know that I have messed up in my past here, here, and here, and I'm okay with that, and I'm just going to be okay with sitting in the past. But healing It's so hard, so hard to let go of brokenness and to accept healing. But it's so important because on the other side, you get to be more like Jesus. Jesus is awesome. Like, he is so cool. Jesus is my best friend. We're homies. We're together. We have so much fun. Like, we just hang out. And um, when I was in high school, I had a teacher tell me that our job was to be the moon. And the moon has no light unless it reflects the sun. And so our job, if you want to write this down, is to be the moon. In discipleship, the goal is to be the moon. We have no light unless we reflect the sun. And I think that's beautiful because the moon is beautiful in itself. But when the light shines on it, you can see the cool little spots, the sea of tranquility, all the fun little, like, flags that they put in or didn't, if you believe the conspiracy theory. It's okay. (laughs) There's room for everyone at the table. Um, (laughs) But... It's beautiful. Discipleship is beautiful because you're sacrificing yourself for Jesus. And that is really difficult, but it's such a beautiful, beautiful process to get from friendship to discipleship. 
And when you fail, to stick with Jesus and to say, I am the worst, and that's okay, because Jesus is the best, and my goal is to be like Jesus. I think, too, Peter's a great example of that failure transition point, because he denies Jesus three times. You know, he's out in the boat fishing, John 20, 21, and uh, he sees Jesus on the shore, and he jumps after he's denied Jesus, Jesus risen from the dead. He jumps in the water, swims to Jesus, and is like, you know, not even my failure, not even all the, the mistakes I've made is going to keep me away from you. I want to be in front of you. I want to be with you. And, and I know Jesus always welcomes us, arms wide open. You don't see Jesus doing shame on you. How come you didn't listen to me? I told you after three years, and you still didn't believe me. It didn't. Jesus didn't do any of that stuff. He just said, you know, do you love me? I think that's the pivot point, really, is that whole love thing. And, and I bring to your attention as well John. Because I think John is a great example of that whole uh, transition, acquaintance, friendship, and then discipleship. Because John, when you look at John, he's, he wrote the second highest quantity of the New Testament. If you think about him, okay, we got Paul. Paul, Paul wrote all kinds of epistles. But John wrote the gospel, three epistles, first, second, third John. And he wrote the book of Revelation. And so when you look at him and you look at who he is and the disciple, he's got his own perspective, unique insight, wisdom, a reflection of Jesus. Um, and it all revolves, for John, it all revolves around love, flat out. If you read First John, the, God, the epistle, it's just the flat out, full on, the reflection of love. And I think John is a super powerful example of what it looks like um, and I want to leave you with this verse for you to consider. It's Galatians 4.19. And at the end of the verse, it says, Till Christ be formed in you. And as we're moving in these various, you know, pl places and pieces in our relationship with Jesus. And I, I think and when we do, you know, sometimes we might be friends. And I said earlier, you might swing over to an acquaintance. Maybe we found that happening during all the Christmas festivities, holidays, or busy seasons. Or maybe you kind of moved from a coin. But ultimately, let's, let's keep in mind, till Christ be formed in us. Till we reflect the S-O-N. Right? That's our whole objective. And I can't do that on my own. You ever try to make it, make yourself right? It doesn't necessarily work. Like you, you'll hit a Kevin in your life. And you may not be the most Christ-like with Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was okay, mostly, but I want us to just continually be thinking, till Christ be formed in us, till Christ be formed in us. So as we consider some action points, um, takeaways for this, uh, Isabel, what's the first action point? I like this one because it's kind of your fat pitch. Okay, so I'm going to get kind of academic for a second. Bear with me. <laughs> so Aristotle, can I hear it for Aristotle? woo woo. <laughs> so he did a great study on friendship and the different kinds of friendship in his book, The Nicomachean Ethics. It's another 25 cent word, and I don't know what it means. Um, but he defines a true friend as someone who loves for the sake of the other person. And I think that if we want to be true friends, or I would say disciples with Jesus, we love not for the sake of us, but for the sake of the other person. Friendship, deep, intentional relationship, discipleship with Jesus is not about how much we can get from it, but it's about what we can give from it. It's about how we can be friends with people. I mean, my, one of my best friends, Allie, you know, I don't go to Chili's every Wednesday because I really like their food. I go to Chili's every Wednesday because she's had a hard week, I've had a hard week, and I show up so I can listen to her and so that she can listen to me. And we're friends for the sake of each other. The things that we do, my roommate, Allison, she's in the back. Everyone say, hi, Allison. Hola. <laughs> the things that we do, the sacrifices that we make, I don't know if any of you remember college, but sometimes living with the same person for a year can get kind of weird. And you might get be like, I want the fridge space for my LaCroix, not your LaCroix. But just being, showing up and making the sacrifice of you can have the fridge space. That's for the sake of someone else. That's a teeny tiny little example that you can do. But even, you know, intentional sacrifice. Jesus says, greater love has no man than this than to sacrifice his life for another. 
literally, okay, yes, Jesus did that. But figuratively, what does that mean for you? Your time, your energy, your effort, love languages, knowing someone's love language and going out of your way, but loving for the sake of another person. That is what discipleship is about. And that's what Jesus does for us. And that's what we should do for Jesus. Loving him, not because of all the cool things that he gives us, but loving him because that's what he wants us to do. Loving him so that we can love on him. You know, you can love on Jesus and that's, he loves that. And that's awesome. And that's where intimacy and relationship is formed. And when we practiced, you talked about um, you're doing your Jesus, making space for oh Jesus. Gosh, I want you to yeah. tell them that because that was really astounding. So I took a class called Jesus is the Thesis. How exciting is that? And in that class, we talk about Jesus. What? <laughs> we do. And so in that class, I really got to know who Jesus was. And that translated for me in my personal time. And so I started going on dates with Jesus. And I would go to a movie, and I would choose a seat that had one seat open. And it could be, like, not a very Christian movie. But I was spending time with Jesus. I was on a date with Jesus. And we were just hanging out. And in my car, you know, I can either listen to Machine Gun Kelly for the entire 45-minute drive it takes me to get up north. Or I can turn the music off and just spend time with Jesus. And that's another practical way. Jesus just wants to spend time with you. Like, he just wants to hang out. What do you do with your friends? You hang out with them. You text them, or they text you. For me, they text me because I'm terrible at texting. But you just spend time with them. You go out of your way. Go to a coffee shop. Put in your AirPods. No one has to know that there's not music in there. It's just time with Jesus. He just wants to hang out with you, doing things that you do in your everyday life, going shopping. And instead of just being like, ooh, this is cute, being like, Jesus, do you think this is cute? And listening, because he's talking all the time. Jesus is awesome. He just wants to hang out with you, to spend time with you. And I would also encourage, as action point, another one is let's, let's maybe take the next quarter through the end of March, and let's look at reading through the Gospels. Because as we do that, we get to know Jesus. And it's been interesting to me. I love, I love, love, love reading the Gospels. And what I found, and I did, you know, I did this series this year called Conversations with Jesus. Remember in my four little signs, you got tired of those signs, you know, for later, all those guys. But I remember as I was working on those sermons and as I was reading, because I was reading in my quiet time, not to get a sermon, I was reading to know Jesus right, and be present with Jesus, and what I found from reading the Gospels so frequently is a lot of times when I would read what Jesus was saying, what Jesus was doing, it kind of blew my mind, I just said, and you're like, how could it blow your mind, (laughs) you've been living this stuff for like decades, it's true, but I think sometimes when we come with fresh eyes, fresh perspective, fresh openness in our hearts, I want to know you, Jesus, and unpack don't untangle the perceptions that I've had that have been shaped by religion, that have been shaped by disappointment, by that have been shaped by dis- deception, because the enemy tries to deceive us. But let's just be very, very intentional that we want to get to know Jesus. Because at the end of this, it's Jesus at the center. We sang that song, Jesus be the center of it all. Nothing else matters. No one else matters. Jesus at the center. And and that's our end game. And as we get to know Jesus, I find Jesus, the more I get to know him, the more I want to know him. And the more I know him deeper, the deeper I want to know him. And I find that I can never, I have this appetite for the infinite. I have an insatiable appetite for Jesus. Because only Jesus, who is infinite, can speak to my insatiable appetite. And that's my prayer for all of us watching online in this room. That our appetite for Jesus in this next month, next three months, would increase. For some of us, we like sweet food. How many of you have a sugar tooth? You're like, woo, that's kind of your weak spot. For some of us, we like the salty stuff. Anybody on the salty stuff? MSG is our friend. (laughs) I'd like for Jesus to be our appetite, our core desire in our soul.
So how many of you would say yes to letting your appetite for Jesus grow? I just want you to put your hand on your heart. Everybody that says yes to that, I want to pray for us that our appetite for Jesus increases. So I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're here. And I know, I know that you accentuate and magnify, you glorify Jesus. So Holy Spirit, we give you permission to increase our appetite for Jesus. Help us to be more and more hungry for Jesus in our thoughts, in our souls, in our hearts, in our desires. I pray, Holy Spirit, Galatians 4.19, till Christ be formed in us. I pray for each of us that we would reflect Jesus because of our intense, all-consuming appetite for you, Jesus. We love you. We thank you for who you are. Thank you for a new year and a fresh beginning, a new day, a new season. We celebrate who you are in resurrection life, newness of life. Thank you, Jesus, for your love to us, for us, and increasing our appetite for you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we finish, I want to minister a couple verses. Isabel and I were like, ooh, let's, let's, let's leave a little bit of space at the end, see what Jesus wants to do. We're all about that. And uh, have a verse. Of course, you know, I want your feedback. I always tell you this. Give me a 10 is really great, 5 is medium, and 0 is you missed the plot. Just don't say it out loud in front of everybody. Like, come to me at the end. I remember somebody did that to me a couple years ago here, and I was like, wow. They yelled out, that makes no sense. And I was like, thank you. I feel so embarrassed. (laughs) You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Exactly. That's true. But a bank shot has a higher probability. Anyways. (laughs) basketball West Virginia lost yesterday I just got to say Chris Beard anyways for those of you that are curious <laughs> Nathan where are you yes can I get a witness um, Angela I have a verse for you and it is Colossians 1 verse 9 and it says um, that we ask that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding and I feel like Holy Spirit's going to give you some fresh knowledge wisdom understanding being filled with the knowledge of God, particularly for this year. Um, the stuff that's happened in the past is a little bit of a con- conclusion and wrapping it up and kind of finishing it off and saying it's done. I'm not looking at the past. I'm being filled with the knowledge of God's will for me now as well as into the future. And so there's a little bit of this forgetting the past and looking ahead to the future, but also being open to God filling you with the knowledge of his will. And, and I would encourage you in this season, be very intentional to ask God, what is your will? I want to be filled with your will. Not only with your will, but also how to do it. The knowledge of his will and understanding how to do it. Application. So getting direction, wisdom, input on decisions and, and, and crossroads. But then also the steps to go into the direction and the will that God reveals to you. So in this season, I would say in the next even two to four weeks that you really press in. I need to be filled with the knowledge of your will. You said you would. And also give me the steps to execute on what that looks like for my daily life and the decisions, how to roll those into into reality mode and execution. So be encouraged as you ask and ask God for the knowledge of his will. He's filling you with that. And the idea of this word filling in the Greek means to overflow. And so it's not just kind of incremental pieces and parts, but it's the idea of taking a cup and overflowing it. And that's the sense of of the knowledge of God's will filling you, overflowing your capacity, overflowing your being uh, with all of his will and more. And so it's not going to be something that's kind of smoke and mirrors, but there's going to be a fullness and awareness and overflow that you'll be like, woo, that's abundantly clear. Um, And then you'll have the steps to uh, make that into a reality. So just be encouraged. That's what God has for you. And I have this at the end here if you want that as well. And then you can give me your feedback if you'd like at the end here. (laughs) 
Yeah, uh, I have a verse for you, ma'am, in the, like, purple scarf and the pink shirt with a gray wave at me. Yep, right there with the gloves. Um, I got John 14, 1, and it says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And I felt like the Holy Spirit is giving you such a spirit of confidence moving into this next year um, and where there's chaos and doubts in your heart and not a lot of understanding. And I feel like the Holy Spirit is, there's this need for understanding that we have. We need to think of every possible outcome. What if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? But the Holy Spirit is calming the what ifs in your heart and he's bringing you confidence and he's bringing you awareness of his love and his perfect plan and his perfect peace and just settling on you as you move into this next year with just such joy and such a capacity for joy that just goes unmeasured and is humongous and crazy and out of this world. But he's blessing you. And do not let your heart be troubled. All the what ifs are not, are not, anything compared to how amazing his love is for you and how perfect his plan is for you. Sweet. I have a verse for this chick right here and you have on orange stripe and then there's green on your shoulders and you're looking down you're like is that me? Reese just pointed at you yes it is you. (laughs) So and I have this here for you at the end as well so you can come and get it. It is Jeremiah 33 verse 3. And it says, call to me and I will answer you and will tell you great and mighty things that you don't know. And I just have this real sense that God is saying to you, call unto me. I'm going to answer you. I'm going to answer you. And I'm going to tell you stuff that will blow your mind. Absolutely exceed your wildest dreams. But to see those things come into reality, the first step is to call. Call to me. And then with the idea of calling is the anticipation that God will answer you. And he says he will. Call to me and I will answer you. And then when God answers you, give space for the impossible. And and it might be your tendency to say, that can't happen. That's too good to be true. Man, that, that I, how could that ever be? And to question and to kind of say, well, you know, figure it out. How, and it doesn't make any sense. But God is saying to you, let's start with calling. You're going to call. I'm going to answer. And when God answers you, appreciate that God is the God of the impossible. God is not limited by space, time, boundaries, the laws of physics and, and, and rules of the universe. God is the author, <laughs> wrote all that stuff. And so what is impossible for you is easy. So don't just disqualify what God says to you and say, that's, that's, that's ridiculous. That's insane. That's ludicrous. That could never, how, none of that. Just put that in the easy box because that's God's territory and, and just kind of yield and surrender the impossible and say, I trust and believe you. Um, and I, I have confidence that you're God and I don't have to understand everything for you to be God and for you to say, and, and some of this is saying yes to God. Yes to what seems to be illogical, impossible, and improbable even. Just say yes, and you'll help. It'll be kind of the cycle of you're saying yes, and then you're calling. God answers, shows you impossible, mighty things. And you say yes, and then you go back to calling. So just don't think that it's a one-time thing, but just participate in this whole adventure. It's kind of a cycle for you. It's an adventure, and the more you say yes... Uh, the easier it will be to call. So just be determined in your soul and your heart that in this season for these days in front of you that you're calling, God's answering, and God is showing you stuff that will blow your mind and encourage your soul and do, do who God is. So be encouraged. Keep calling. And last one for me. So right here with the like blue and white striped plaid shirt. Wave at me. Yes. Okay, so I have... Um, a fun Hebrew word for you. It's chesed, which I have a tattoo of, believe it or not. Um, and it means loving kindness, covenant love, and even loyalty. And I feel like right now God just wants to honor you and you are very loyal. And he says, that is a gift that I've given you and it is my pleasure to take joy in you. And the Lord loves your loyal heart and he sees the sacrifices that you've made for the sake of loyalty to yourself, to your family, for others. And he says, well done, you're doing good. He says, keep going. I believe in you. I love you. Go to the next glory to glory. The next glory is waiting for you, and I have it for you, and it's perfect, and you're doing great. And sometimes we just need a little encouragement and the Holy Spirit saying, I see you. I love you. I know you. I've given you good gifts and good gifts on purpose. And who you are, I planned out, 
and look at how amazing you are. Look at how amazing you turned out. So the Holy Spirit is just wanting to love on you in this time and in this moment. And I have a little paper too, if you want to come and get it. And along that line is Psalms 136. I would encourage you to read that chapter because there's a phrase and then it says, for your loving kindness endures forever. There's a phrase, your loving kindness, and it alternates. Phrase, loving kindness endures forever. Phrase, alternate, alternate, alternate. And that's the key theme for the entire chapter of Psalms 136. And so I just encourage you as you read that, you're going to see um, the loving kindness of God in ways you've never seen before and affirming uh, your consistency and loyalty and just saying, hey, God, this is a reflection is a reflection. Well done, my good and faithful servant, my beloved son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's what I sense God saying to you. You're his beloved son and he's well pleased with you. Like you make a smile, he beams. He's like, wow, I'm so, so proud of you, son. I'm so proud of how well you love, how loyal your consistency, your faithfulness. Well done, my beloved son. I'm pleased with you. I am very, very pleased with you. Not because you've earned it, but because of your love and connection, letting me love through you and also letting me love you. Well done. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So on that happy note, little friends and family, we want you to keep working closer, keep growing closer, keep connecting with Jesus, keep being available for Jesus to love you. And uh, keep reflecting till Christ be formed in you. God bless you. If we gave you a verse, pop up here at the front. And we'll be happy to give you our little sheets. We'll see you hopefully on Wednesday because we have worship night. It's going to be super wonderful, powerful. And Jose, hola, como esta usted? I just had to do that just to be fun. All right. Peace out, guys. We love you. <laughs>